With the start of a new melody, a spark ignites in the hazy instinctive consciousness of a little theropod dinosaur's mind. He knows it is time to hatch. He has heard many songs in his six-month incubation. Mother and father both sing with the rise and fall of the sun, a sound so deep he can barely hear them, yet each pulse of their infrasonic vibrations is like a comforting embrace. There are a few higher calls, two voices he has identified which often sing chants of play and mischief. This song is new, a call to break free of the shell that has kept him safe all this time, an encouragement to tap scratch and push, but the voice is by far the most frequent and familiar. Heeding the call and the reflex it elicits, our chick contorts. He pushes his snout up, shoving at the same spot with his clawed feet while his back braces it against yet another side of his shell. There are cracks, and he hears the shifting sands below, yet no progress is yet made. Finally, after straining for several minutes, the tip of his snout pierces the membrane. A series of cracks is his prelude to the outside world. As he draws in his first breath, a thousand scents greet him all at once. His brain is large and quite proficient, which will be instrumental in any chance he has of surviving, but it is quickly overwhelmed with so much new. His right eye is overstimulated by everything to be seen to the point that only processing is a hazy white. It doesn't help that the effort of even taking in the first step was exhausting. He takes a moment just to breathe. After what feels like an eternity taking it all in, he hears the song again. This time he knows the source. It is the first thing he sees. It is his older brother, who we shall name Druk, the Dolani word for a martial arts instructor. With another beckoning chorus, the chick pushes out his foot. The air is dry and cool, quite unpleasant from the comforting warmth within his shell. However, now that he's had a taste of fresh air and a first stretch, his body is screaming to break free. It is a feat of labor, done in several sprints as he tears through the membrane and pushes out a section of hard shell. Finally, his exposed leg and head offer enough weight outside the shell that it topples over and the resulting cracks give him the opportunity to wriggle free. Once our chick is fully exposed to the elements, he looks about. He is in a nest of sand and dung on a hill overlooking an open prairie. Golden grass dominates the landscape in all directions, swaying like waves in the breeze. The rattling of each blade against the neighboring seed and stem is an ever-present drone. He's too small to see, but their nest is atop a hill just northeast of the confluence, a meeting place between two rivers. This is the perfect territory for a predator looking to hunt prey that migrate along these rivers. The sun rises to the east, casting warm light over the sea of grass. He hears the call of insects, wind, and distant beasts, able to pin their locations thanks to asymmetrical ears, and can smell a wide range of creatures that will one day be familiar, though, for now, it's little more than olfactory white noise. There are four other eggs in the nest with him. Three are also in stages of hatching, though the fifth sibling remains still. A few flies buzz about, capturing the chick's attention. Druk is watching the chicks closely, emitting his siren song to encourage the little ones to break free. With twitching motions, the chick gets up and tries to get used to moving his body. He flexes his hand, curling two long claws on each hand, which will one day be instrumental to his survival. Long legs and jaws will be just as critical. He's not yet aware of himself or the similarities to Druk above, but just like a bird, a part of him has imprinted on his older brother, and a budding awareness of their similar forms begins to take hold. Like the chick, 
Druk is an Uktan, a species of large theropod dinosaur. They are descended from Megaraptorans, a clade of mostly small and medium-sized predators most common in the southern hemisphere of Earth. Their ancestors came to Chimere during the Cretaceous. They persisted as small predators in the shadow of the resident giants, Carcharodontosaurs, which were the top predators of Arvel until around 15 million years ago. The meek inherited the desolate world, and the ancestors of Uktan evolved to become large as their Carcharodontosaur overlords, eventually spreading throughout all three continents of the tropical and temperate world. Unlike Carcharodontosaurs, which killed prey with long and powerful jaws, Megaraptorans only used their bright to catch and restrain prey, instead using their long-clawed hands to make the kill. This proved more efficient at killing a wider range of prey, helping in this new world had more swift mammals than Chimere had before the Great Extinction. Once they got large, this lineage of Megaraptorans thrived. Wherever Megaraptorans went, they became the top predator, much like big cats did on Earth. The Uktan evolved on Kairul, the eastern continent, then came back to the known world as the golden grass now surrounding the chick's nest took over and replaced the green grass once found here. Druk calls again, nudging the chicks to keep him alert. He tries to stand, using his snout to push up, but hatching was too exhausting, and he slumps back down. He draws in a deep breath. Like a bird, his barrel-shaped torso is surprisingly light, considering his hollow bones are not only massive lungs, but also ample secondary chambers that will one day make up his respiratory system, and therefore endurance being second to none. He has to build up his strength to make that possible. For now, he's exhausted, and can rally for a little more than sitting up and looking about. A pair of familiar voices greets him, and our chick turns to see two theropods approach. They are much larger than him, though notably smaller than Druk. These are the twins, middle siblings. Both are female, as the male chicks of their clutch were killed by a nest raider shortly after they hatched. Druk killed many, but he couldn't stop all of the raiders, and not in no small part because he was the only survivor of his year. In fact, one of the twins, who we shall call Miaka, is playing with the corpse of a honey badger she caught the night before. There are many threats to Uktan chicks out on the prairie, and the deadliest of them are too small for adults to catch. Having older siblings around means a lot of these threats are neutralized, and each year more young survive thanks to the protection of their older siblings. In return, the parents keep out most of the threats that might endanger the older Uktan chicks, while also providing food, though as much as half of what the twins eat is caught by themselves around the nest, and hunting these small threats is also giving them a lot of practice in how to kill, which will be critical once they're out on their own. Back when Druk was a chick, their parents had to take turns hunting so one could be by the nest for protection. Druk was the only survivor of his clutch, his parents' second year of laying, and in the year before and two after him were all wiped out by nest raiders when they were small. Uktan mortality is highest in these first years, though having older siblings dramatically increases the odds. Now, with Druk keeping watch, both parents can hunt together, increasing their chances of success, and having both experienced hunters in action means that they can bring back all the food Druk could ask for in return for his efforts. Miaka and her twin Bita spare our chick and the nest only a passing glance before they start fighting over the badger carcass. Druk ignores them, keeping his focus on our chick and the others. Though instinct is part of it, there are among the most intelligent of dinosaurs, and some part of him might be aware of the dangers his little sibling will face and how substantial his involvement in their survival will be. Things are easier now that the twins are around to help with the monkey, snake, lizard, armadillo, badger, small pterosaur, and jackals that come around. But they are only a year old and at 30 kilograms, far too small to fend off the larger threats. When a hyena or blue cockatrice approaches, 
Druk is on his own, and at a hundred seventy kilos, he still has to be wary of sloth, terror birds, and giant cockatrices. He has also learned that unrelated Uktan can be a threat. With all the dangers around, Druk looks down to our chick with somber care. The other three eggs that have been hatching continue to do so. First is the largest of the eggs. The size differential is not substantial, but it is noticeable. The chick emerging from this egg has the same bright blue eyes with brown patches and striped feathery body, though his stripes and eye patch are darker, and base coat is a few sage lighter than our chick's golden brown. He shakes himself out, taking a deep breath, and slouches against the side of the nest. The next two hatch quickly after, a male and female, both a little bit smaller than our chick, and quickly sit together. The last and smallest egg still has not moved. Druk leans in close, singing over the egg. Nothing. Our chick shuffles over to the egg. With each step, he feels a slight pulse and reverberation through pads in his feet. He presses his snout against the egg. It is warm and he can smell the still living chick inside. Maybe it just doesn't want to come out? Our chick taps his snout against it. Perhaps it needs help breaking out of the shell. Or maybe it's just stubborn. He joins Druk in song. It's more a mimicry than an ominous effort to aid, but it gets a murmured response. Druk and our chick keep singing. Finally, the first crack appears. As soon as the segment breaks free, our chick pecks at it, pulling the sections and some membrane to be cast aside. Though the eye looking at him is a familiar brew, the rest of the tick inside is entirely black. The melanistic runt of the clutch struggles inside trying to break free of her cage. As she pushes a leg free, our chick takes out a few more pieces. Druk watches curiously. This is not a behavior he has ever seen before. Once she is free, Druk begins clearing the eggshells from the nest. The melanistic runt nestles beside our chick, shivering in the cold morning breeze. Later that morning, our chick feels the rumbling calls of their parents returning from the hunt. He and their other chicks rise to their feet, though any steps are shaky and unstable. A deep instinct knows that the booming song of his parents is a promise of their first meal. When the other chicks and their siblings all have a similar body plan, being quite slender and lanky, the adults are shockingly robust. Their chests are almost as wide as they are tall, and their legs, tail, and neck are packed with muscle. Another contrast with the young is in skull shape. While the juveniles have narrow wedge-shaped heads and their eyes face out to reflect their status as vulnerable creatures, the adults have a fairly narrow snout, backed by a very wide face, so wide that it can stare directly ahead with almost as much binocular vision as a human. The mother and father are of similar size, although like most males, the father is slightly larger, more robust, and has a darker mane. Despite being built like Tyrannosaurus rex, they are as much as two tons lighter than a rex of similar dimensions due to how extremely hollow their bones are and the degree of air sacs spread throughout their torsos. Unlike a rex, their arms are large, each ending in two massive talons and a flexible third finger possessing a blunt claw. In these formidable arms, both mother and father hold prey. Their father, named Trok, is holding a large pronghorn antelope doe. He holds it under his right arm as the second claw of his left hand was injured by a kelatar years prior and is now bent in such a way that a conventional grip is difficult. The mother, named Hyani, holds a larger pronghorn buck, able to do so despite her smaller size. They killed a third but had their fill at the kill site. Juveniles are fully feathered aside from snout, feet, and palm. The parents have feathered manes and sparse yet broad plumes along their back, with most of their bodies having relatively thin skin 
and tiny hard feathers called reticulous scales. While juveniles have feathers for camouflage and the prairie grass helping to insulate them during the cold nights, the feathers of adults have the opposite thermoregulatory effect. Sparse yet wide feathers puts shade on the body and can be shaken to both incorporate a breeze to the skin to cool down feathers themselves, which may have taken in too much heat from the sun. The rest of their skin being thin helps these enormous predators shed heat as they chase prey. Despite an assumption that these feathers would make them overheat, the feathers are actually instrumental in keeping these active tropical giants cool and comfortable. Hyani and Trok set down their kills. Th though the twins rush in greeting to help pick at the carcass, the parents close the distance to meet their new clutch of young. To each they sing a song, so deep it is felt more than heard. To the chicks, this is like an auditory embrace. The intelligence of Uktan is debated, but their social complexity certainly adds credence to the theory of a higher intellectual capacity, especially since it appears they have unique songs for each chick that could be argued to be a name. For the purposes of this story, we assign our own names. As this Uktan family is within the territory of the Dolani, a nomadic faction of Shu Chimerans, the naturalists involved in this study deferred to the language and folklore characters as a template. The largest chick is called Brakopa, the name of a mythical Dolani warlord, meaning horse tamer. Jakya and Japli are the pair who won't leave each other's side, and are the feminine and masculine, force, rain, and star, respectively. The little runt of the clutch is named Kyan, meaning shy or curious. To our chick, we give the name Kahai, Hungry Eyes, a spirit of trickery and curiosity in many Shu religions. Since their meal an hour ago, the parents have been working overtime to prepare the first meal for their chicks. While they do not produce crop milk like pigeons or theskelosaurs, the lining of their crop is a rough and helps tenderize meat that their young can easily pull apart and digest. For the first six months, during the plentiful wet season, the chicks will enjoy this catering, though once their mother Hyani begins building up nutrients for the next generation, only their father will feed them and will therefore become infrequent, prompting them to eat from the carcass or seek out their own prey in the area. For now, the focus is entirely on these young chicks, while Druk and the twins feed on the pronghorns their parents brought back. There is plenty of food, yet Brakopa quickly asserts his size at the center of the pile. Not a problem in these times of plenty, which will only get better as the storms bring more game to the region, but getting the lion's share will undoubtedly benefit Brakopa once times get tough. For now, the others eat around him, content with the plentiful spoils of their parents' success. Though Kian was at first timid, once Kahai starts eating and there's space beside for her, she moves in and outpaces Brakpa in veracity. The hill on which the nest is built overlooks their bountiful territory. Again, it is at the confluence of two great rivers, one from the north and one from the east, meeting and then flowing south. Many game species migrate along both rivers, meaning that even in the dry months, this territory is one with plentiful game. The position is high on the hill, with grass regularly plucked by the parents, offering a degree of safety from the brush fires that can plague the region during the dry season, and the vantage point also complements a predator with among the best eyesight of any animal. For Uktan, the territory is excellent, and the pair must mark it regularly and defend it from interlopers. It is a demanding position, but given the size and health of their family, one can see they clearly thrive. The parents leave twice throughout the day as they must patrol and mark their territory. After a hard day's work, they return home. Proud of the additions to their family and seeing all provided for, the mother and father settle down on either side of the nest. The sun sets in the west, and under a fiery sky, the great monarchs of the Housie Prairie 
take their rest. Sun rises to blood in parched sand. The wet season has ended, and with it the times of plenty. Six months have passed since Kahai and his clutch all hatched. Their parents provided an abundance of food, and they have grown quickly on it. A new clutch of eggs has just been laid. Thanks to the vigilant protection of Druk and the twins, all six eggs are now safe and five hatchlings from earlier that year have survived their first few months when Uktan are most vulnerable. That was until last night. In the dead of night, a pack of hyenas snuck into the territory of the monarchs. As hyenas are large enough to kill the twins, not to mention the chicks, and the parents were too slow to mount a substantial defense, it fell to Druk to protect his family. Though the hyenas were repeatedly thwarted, one tripped Kahai as he fled the chaos and went in for a bite. Druk caught the beast and immediately pierced its chest. Unfortunately, now that Druk was occupied, the others evaded the parents and dived into the cluster of other chicks. As the young Megaraptoran scattered and screamed, a hyena caught hold of Jakia. It only took a quick bite and shake for the brittle theropod to be killed. Like all the hatchlings, Jakia grew a lot in the past six months and weighed nearly 12 kilograms, but that's hardly enough to defend herself. Their mother caught the hyena holding her daughter, and her own bite was equally lethal to a mammal weighing only 100 kilograms. Yet the damage had already been done. Kahai and Brakopa both had narrow misses, and several eggs were crushed or taken, but Druk returned from his kill and chased off the rest. He caught up to and killed two more of the hyenas throughout the night, but his fury would not bring Jakia to life. Uktan Vision is not particularly keen at night. Kahai has seen in the ultraviolet spectrum, so the mammals and the resulting blood glowed enough for him to see. Light illuminates their trauma to our eyes, but to Kahai, at least he can now see more than just the reminders of their loss. Druk is clearly still enraged. He pulls apart the bodies of the hyenas and hisses at the twins when they move in to eat the beasts. Eventually, Father Trok puts a stop to the quarreling, and eats the hyenas so that he can use them to feed the surviving chicks. Druk might yell at his little sisters, but at only a little over 200 kilos now, he's in no position to argue with his seven-ton father. Brakopa happily eats what their father regurgitates later that morning. Kahai and Kian are reluctant, but eventually they follow suit. They are now quite afraid of the scent of hyena, but it's been three days since their parents last fed them, and insects and rodents they have caught here and there have left them wanting. They get over their reservations for the sake of a meal. The twins dig into the first hyena Druk killed. Hyani and Druk still don't eat. 
Neither does Japli. He remains by his sister throughout the day, ignoring the meat their father offers and ensures Brakpa does not steal. Eventually, Japli does pick up the piece, only to set it by the crushed remains of his sister he has never been more than a few paces away from. She does not eat it, of course. The next day, after clearing the broken eggs and accounting for the remaining three in the clutch, their mother and father go to hunt. They return unsuccessful. The day after, they come back with a large camel pulled in half and carried between the pair. The other chicks eat, and Druk is willing to feed on something other than hyena, but Japli does not. Trok removes Jakia's body, taking her far from the territory to not draw in more scavengers. Japli doesn't try to stop him. The next morning, as the sun rises, Japli remains in the nest. He will never wake. It has been a year since Kahai and his siblings hatched. He is still entirely dependent upon his parents, and at 30 kilos he's doubled in size since last we saw him. Constant play with Brakapa, Kyan, and the twins has honed his strength, as has relentless hunting of anything small and fast that catches his eye. While Brakapa has been content to eat whatever he is given, and taking the majority of what they are brought shows in his weight at over 35 kilos, Kahai's curiosity and eagerness to chase and honing instincts will serve him better later in the long run. Kian is still a bit timid, though whenever Kahai gives chase, she seems to take it as a sign that it is safe and is a quite skilled mouser herself once she builds up the initiative. She doesn't always follow Kahai when he ventures further and further from the nest, but having her keep watch and call back when she sees something has saved Kahai from danger several times. Or at least alerted Druk to come rushing to his aid. Her timid nature is starting to wane into persistence. Once she works up the courage to make an effort, she rarely surrenders. Kahai often starts an endeavor, drawing her in, and while he may get bored and give up, once she's locked in, she doesn't give up. This caught up to her a few months ago when Kahai dug up a Fiskelosaur, a small burrowing dinosaur, and after Kahai eventually gave up and it burrowed deeper, she then continued to try to dig it out. After almost an hour of effort, she stuck her nose in and was dealt a deep wound along her snout by the Fiskelosaur's claw as she withdrew the creature from its den. She and Kahai got to enjoy the meal, although she still has a nasty scar to show for the effort. The eggs of the next generation are now warm and waiting. Although the dry season was harsh as ever, their parents were able to keep them all well fed. The three survivors of the last year clutch are in good health, as are the twins, Druk, who now weighs 250 kilos and stands as tall as the man, is thriving on a diet that his parents are bringing in ample leftovers and any nest raiders who dare cross into his range. This year's clutch contains all three that survived the hyena attack, a testament to the diligence of Druk and the twins while their parents hunted. The eggs all hatch to Druk's calls. Kahai joins him. All three are in good health. Their parents return later that day with a Drokel, and as Laz Marian dinosaur, also called a giant runendrake, and in regurgitate the first meal to their three new siblings. At around 5 kilos, the chicks are tiny. Kahai and Brakopa both go for some of the food regurgitated by their father, but Druk hisses at them and they back off. They must now get their own food or join the twins and Druk at the carcass. It is dismaying to be so aware of the tender and alluring meat following the new chicks, but Kahai is now used to seeing older siblings eat. Though Brakopa keeps looking back to the nest, he now seems more intent on asserting his place at the carcass. 
Though quite large for his age, he's still far from imposing to any of his older siblings, and the twins both shove him aside as he tries to push his way in. Druk is also sure to get his fill, and the rest all chew along the back as he digs into the chest and flanks. Once Druk is finished, the twins and Brakpa circle around for the choice parts. Kahai and Kian each take along the back and ribs, their more slender snouts enabling them to get bits their larger siblings had to overlook. Eventually, all the young have had their fill, and they get back to the new triplets. To dissuade scavengers, their father takes the remains of the Elismarian out a few paces, though as the first rains are hopefully coming soon, there won't be as much concern as during the dry months about approaching threats. Good times are ahead once more, and the family is in excellent condition. At least, the good times should be coming. A week goes by, and the rains still have not come. Local flora and fauna are all struggling in its absence. Hyenas, cockatrice, and other threats are getting bolder. A pair of harakundi, terror birds that stand almost three meters tall, have been hovering on the fringes of the Yuktan territory. When both parents left, they were only about half a kilometer off before the terror birds closed in and Druk called for their aid. He's heavier and better armed than the terror birds, but both have astonishing reach with their hooked beaks, and he knows he can't hold them off for long. Father Trok and Mother Hyani rush back to see the birds off, and the father remains. They hunt better together, and that's how they became a bonded pair in the first place, but if only one can hunt, she's the better option. Both of her hands are at full capacity, and their father is larger and more intimidating to the terror birds. Once the creatures realize their next meal won't be as easy as one of them occupying Druk while the other gathers up the young Uktan, the birds jog off in search of another option. Later that evening, they hear a strange call in the distance. Not to stress, but Hyani is summoning them all the same. She is far out on the prairie. Though Kahai has wandered almost half a kilometer out from the nest, he has never gone so far that he couldn't see home. Yet her calls are far from view. Even so, Druk seems to know what must be done. He climbs into the nest and takes a chick under each arm. The last chick screams out in confusion. They have only been hatched for a week and are still wobbly on their feet. Miyaka comes over and picks up the third in both arms. She's a bit too small to do this comfortably, but she manages. Trok leads the way, scanning the horizon with eyes four meters off the ground and vision superior to that of an eagle. Their father can see his mate even at this distance. Though the raid of the family is hesitant at first, once Druk and their father start moving, the rest follow at a rapid pursuit. After walking for several kilometers, their father brings them to a strange sight. Deep within a gulch, their mother has captured a strange monster. Kahai and the rest take ample inhalations. It smells and looks a bit like the sloths that their parents have brought to them a few times over the years, though the scent is a bit closer to tank jackals and other armadillos. It has a massive shell on its back, notably larger than their parents' torso, though in grand total it still weighs less than half as heavy as the adult Uktan, since the body is all contained within the shell, save for a studded tail. This beast is a Kelotar, largest of the prairies and Arthurans, and at almost three tons, this enormous bull is used to being ignored by predators. He came down to the gulch to dig for water his keen nose picked up, and now there's nowhere for him to go. Luckily for him, Hyani doesn't stand much of a chance on her own. Her talons are each a little over half a meter in length, and if she stabbed once where his armored head meets his shell, it could be a quick kill. However, a twist where she's placed a stab could easily break the claw or her finger. If her claw gets stuck in a Kalatar and it's not a killing blow, she could lose the whole hand. 
To make matters worse, the studded tail could break her leg if it lands at the right angle. For now, the two have been at an impasse. Unfortunately for the giant armadillo, in their years hunting as a team before they even established their first territory, Trok and Hyani became quite proficient in a wide range of prey, including Kilatar. This is a very large male, but he's not the biggest they've killed. Kahai and the other chicks watch in rapt attention as their parents get to work. Trok descends into the ravine, bellowing, flashing his clawed arms, and snapping his jaws to get the Kilatar's attention. The maneuver certainly works. As the beast hunkers down, Hyani grabs the end of the tail. Years of hunting Kelatar has taught her that the legs are surprisingly long, and a back kick from their clawed feet could be very painful. Once she has occupied the restraint of the tail, Croc squats behind the beast on the downhill side, leans his full weight against the shell, and gives it a firm shove. The Kelatar leans ever so slightly against Troc's push and is immobile. Unfortunately, this is what Troc was counting on. As it's leaning its way toward him to counter his efforts, the massive theropod stands with far greater speed than something his size should be capable of doing, grabs the shell with both arms, and pulls. Since the Kelatar was already leaning toward him to resist his push and the slight downhill turn of the gulch fuller hinders him, the great beast begins to tilt. If Trok did this alone, the swing of the tail might help right the beast, but Hyani pulls and rotates the tail in exactly the wrong direction it would need to go in order to offer counterbalance. Trok steps back into side, Hyani lets go of the tail, and the Kelatar is flipped. The shell comes to a slight ridge, which is meant to aid in righting itself, but before the beast is able to flail, Trok lunges in and bites the beast by its lip before pulling back. As the Kelatar's head is out of reach of its claws, Trok thrusts his own talons where jaw meets throat. It is a quick, clean kill honed by years of experience. This is not instinct. Trok's parents were specialists in these beasts that most Uktan find unable to defeat. Specializing in one of the few resident beasts at a time when most game has moved on is a highly successful strategy. Trok's parents taught him the means and maneuver, which he then taught to Hyani as they developed their bond. Her family were pronghorn specialists, expert at corralling and exhausting these abundant yet swift herbivores, which is why they're preferred game during the wet season, but Trok's method has saved the family numerous times during the dry months. Unfortunately, Kalatar are too large and ungainly to get back to the nest. Normally, Trok and Hyani would have their fill and go fetch something else for the older chicks, but since there hasn't been any game in weeks, the parents decided to bring their family to the meal this time. It is also important for the young Uktan to observe. Soon, Druk will be joining them in the hunt, and seeing an expert at work is an important step in the process. Young Uktan do need practice, but they are excellent at learning by observation, and this was certainly a formative experience. Trok and Hyani open the carcass and start with the organs and thigh muscles so their crops can do the work of preparing the next meal for the young chicks. They then eat some of the tougher muscles for their own benefit, then step aside so the juveniles can dig in. Throughout the next two weeks, the rains still haven't come. When the family returns to the nest after the hunt, they have become more mobile by necessity, as Kelatar are the only reliable game and butchering these tanks of muscle and bone is impractical. Finally, a full month late, the first storm arrives, though it is mild. It is not until a full six weeks late that the wet season comes in force sufficient to bring in the herds, and they are not at their normal abundance. The grazing opportunities to the south and east, which herds rely upon during the dry months, has been equally impacted. The family survives, if only barely, 
And while none of them are claimed by the harsh season or the abundant predators, which can now never seem to get a full belly, their mother does not lay a clutch this year. Difficult years go by. At four years old and weighing just over 150 kilos, Kahai is the same age Druk was when he was born, though Kahai is notably lighter due to these hard times. Kian is by his side and even smaller. Though Kahai has lost his stripes in favor of a uniform golden brown feathering along his neck and back, Kian remains dark as ever. They both pant in the heat of the sun, drawing air into the massive sinus cavities of their snouts that keep their brain cool and focused. But this is especially important for Kian, as her dark feathers and scales make her quite prone to overheating. Thankfully, being the runt of their generation, she's smaller and has less to worry about in that respect, but it can still be debilitating during a chase. This challenge, however, becomes an asset at night. This has been their harshest dry season yet, and their mother still hasn't laid a clutch in the past three years. The triplets, their three younger brothers born the year after Kahai, have managed to all pull through. The twins left the family a few weeks ago. There simply wasn't enough food to go around. They each weigh 250 kilos, and local rodent, fowl, and badgers between the occasional proper meal just didn't cut it. On their own, and with far less caloric demands, they stand a much better chance, though Druk chose to remain with their parents. This is common behavior for Ukten. Some young remain with their family until puberty, others disperse long beforehand. Many mouths means more hunting, but there's safety in numbers. Neither method is inherently superior, and there's no telling which method is going to work best in a given situation. Having a versatile strategy and several options allow Uktan to effectively have the best of both worlds. Kian's dark feathers have benefited her in the night, hunting that the youngsters have had to rely upon for sustenance. Even with Brakupa stealing some of her kills, she is sufficiently better at setting up and executing an ambush that she's the only member of the family to regularly get enough food and has taken to feeding the triplets now and then as well. She doesn't have superior night vision to pair with her darker coloration, and lacking key markers like white ear tufts does make communication difficult, but she's endured these challenges and come out strong. Druk has been hunting with their parents. As there are presently no tiny chicks, the threats to their children are much larger, so having one of the adults remain behind is of greater benefit and importance. Also, Druk is much faster than their parents, and has become quite proficient in hunting cursorial prey like pronghorn. While Druk and Hyani are out hunting, very unwelcome guests approach. Kahai doesn't know it, but their father has been monitoring these interlopers for over a week. They've been on the fringes of the territory, never crossing, but ever present. They leave their own scent markers along the perimeter. They are making their intentions known. It is another pair of adult Uktan. 
These two have been bonded for several years, but as new to being fully adults, they were not able to maintain a prime hunting territory or claim it like the family have. Now that they have come into their own, they see the confluence as ideal real estate. Dung does not lie. They can tell the king and queen of the confluence are strained. The newlyweds don't have a family to feed. They can afford to buy their time. They are still a ton lighter than Hiani, and Truk is even larger. They don't dare challenge them in a fair fight, but that's why they waited for Hiani to leave for a hunt. Now that the king is alone, the newlyweds make their move. Even in the grass, which grows two meters along the lowlands from the direction they come, Trok sees them several kilometers off. He roars down at them. While he doesn't want to bring the fight to his offspring, he wants to keep the high vantage point. Knowing where his opponents are is critical to preventing an ambush. Kahai, Kion, and Brakopa watch their father. They and the triplets remain low and still in the tall grass on the perimeter of the nesting site, lower on the hill. They cannot see Hyani and Druk, who have to travel far to find game this late in the dry season. They do see the approaching strangers. More importantly, they can smell them, and both stink of surging hormones as they prepare for a fight. Uktan usually prefer to display and intimidate. Their claws are built to kill, not engage in contest, so if it does come to blows, it could easily be lethal. If the newlyweds are to have a family, now is the time, so the female can bulk up on the nutrients she will need to lay eggs at the end of the rainy season. This is worth killing for. Trok has a territory to defend, and six offspring that could be his legacy. This is worth dying for. Soon, the newlyweds are below. Trok has the advantage of familiarity with his territory, not to mention almost two tons on the male, but these advantages pale in comparison to numbers. He holds position, standing tall and spreading his arms wide. Even with one gnarled finger, his arms and chest are packed with muscle, and he doesn't care that they see his weakness. If he gets hold of one of them, a broken finger won't save them from a killing blow. Uktan torsos are filled with air sacs. Pierce one, and the whole respiratory system is compromised. The two invaders fan out. Killing Trok is their priority, but if they can also kill a few of his children before reinforcements arrive, all the better. They drop dung and roar goading calls up to Trok, flapping their arms and ruffling their manes, but the king is unmoved. Trok has not had to defend his territory in many years, but he has done so several times when he and Hyani first took the territory. He has had to defend their claim alone before. His experience in the endeavor gives him patience. Once they realize the king won't be provoked, they drop the posture and close in. Neither actually strikes, but they are just out of range. They spread, robbing him of the advantageous high ground. The young remain absolutely still. The female charges. Trok reacts, rushing to meet, though as the male makes his move, the female proves hers was a mock charge. As Trok turns, far too quick for his size to be a reflex, showing his was a mock charge too. Rather than meet the larger theropod, the male slows and backs off. Trok claps his jaws at the retreating male's tail, but doesn't make an effort to connect. True, he could catch the male at this distance, but committing to one opponent would leave him open and vulnerable to the other. The intruders fall back to regroup. Trok watched their movements carefully. So far, he hasn't noticed a single imperfection in their stride. They are in excellent condition. Luckily for Trok, he didn't need to fight them. He just needed time. A flash of movement to the south draws the female's attention, and she turns to see Druk race by. At 600 kilos, 
He's 15% of her body weight and of a legitimate threat, yet he's so quick that she barely is able to follow his movements behind her. And that's when Trock attacks. With his head down, the enormous theropod closes a distance and rams into her side, his crown of horns digging in on impact. Thanks to her own quick reflexes, she is able to shift with the momentum so the blow doesn't break bone, but she does lose her footing and crouches to roll downhill. Truck turns, meeting the charge of the young bull. The two male Megaraptorans bite at each other's faces. Face biting is far less dangerous than fighting with their claws, even with their long maxillary fangs and strong bites, so it makes for a safer form of intraspecific combat. However, once a bite and grapple is established, the victor will almost certainly go in for a kill in this instance. They haven't made contact yet, but the intruder backs away from Trock's advance. The female rights herself and begins to stand, but this time, Hyani has arrived. While Trock and the intruder try to determine which will score the stronger bite, Hyani simply goes for the kill. She grabs the intruding female by the back of the neck, ignoring her screams and struggles as she pushes the young female back to the ground. Amidst the cloud of dust kicked up by the confrontation, the screaming Megaraptoran's call are cut to a strained wheeze as Hyani's claws pierce lungs, air sacs, and then throat. The intruding male has quickly transitioned from a duel to prey. He lunges at Trock in a desperate gambit, which the larger male counters with a bite to the snout. The stranger manages to shrug off the bite, but Trock lunges and bites the younger male's arm. It's a quick nip, but his fang pierces deep holes in the male's primary weapon, and he disengages quickly. The young male swipes with his other hand, but the claws of Megaraptorans are meant to pierce, not slice, and Trock's armored snout absorbs the cut. Hyani charges the male. While her hands and jaws stained red with his mate's blood, the young male balks at the sight. He scrambles back, turns and flees. Trock catches him by the tail, this time stopping him, and before the young bull can retaliate, Hyani grabs him by his neck. There is no mercy. Although they are very intelligent animals, mercy is not a concept they are capable of entertaining. Such morality is not under their care or consideration. While they might not know it intellectually, this male may have returned with another mate, this time being more patient and succeeding in their efforts. He cries out in pain and terror, but if he and his mate had their way, they would have killed Trok, and Hyani and Druk would have returned to see their whole family slaughtered. This territory was claimed by Trok and Hyani from another young couple that just ousted a resident family, and someday they will be ousted too. This is another reason why juveniles like the twins sometimes leave early. No couple holds a territory forever. However, today they have held their claim and saved their family. They also have several tons of meat. Uktan had no qualms against cannibalism, and Hyani digs in, fueling her next clutch of eggs with the muscle and bone of those who would have ended her line. Six months later, and the storm and herds have brought good times to the confluence. Hyani lays another clutch, her largest yet, with seven eggs. The young have all grown substantially in this season of plenty, with Brakopa being exceptionally large for his age. Kian has become an expert at night hunting, often preferring to hunt for herself. Even so, she still spends most of her time close to Kahai, who often joins her in the hunt, though more to explore than out of hunger. Their venture further than previous years, perhaps emboldened by their parents of vanquishing the intruders. One afternoon, as Kahai and Kian are sleeping off another night of hunting and their parents are out in pursuit of new prey, another interloper has snuck into the territory. A subadult prairie cockatrice. 
The raptor is a common sight on the prairie, being among the most abundant predators in the 50 to 100 kilo range. While there's still plenty of prey for her to seek out, such as jackal, badgers, and hares, the scent of freshly laid Megaraptoran eggs was too irresistible. The Dromaeosaur keeps low, walking on flat feet to remain low in the grass. The nest is just ahead. She smells older juveniles nearby. Though it makes her cautious, she sees Kahai and Kian sleeping a ways off, with the triplets on the other side of the hill under a sapling prairie maple for some much-needed shade. Druk is right near the nest, on the other side, although dozing off. As the cockatrice gets to the base of the nest, she elevates slightly to look about. She confirms all in sight are asleep. There are seven fresh eggs inside. One under each wing and a third in her jaws will make for a splendid protein-packed meal to send her into the next few months of hard. Before she even reaches her snout into the nest, a shadow passes overhead and lands on her hips and back. 270 kilos of Brokopa crumple her form. Though she was killed on impact, the triumphant Megaraptoron stomps her corpse repeatedly all the same. Kahai and the rest come to investigate, but there are no other threats in the area, and Brokopa has thoroughly put her down. His motives may have been of violence, but that violence was in defense of his family, an instinct which Ukten rely upon for their survival. Throughout the season, Brakopa seems content to remain a well-fed nest guard, a task at which he increasingly invests. As the rainy season is in full and the game is in abundance, Kahai and Kian are brought along for hunts. Chasing and killing nest raiding varmints has been a helpful foundation, but their parents encourage an accompaniment. Today, Hyani brings the pair along to observe her and Druk hunt pronghorn. This is a smaller species than the half-ton Hyani prefers, both due to being more agile and having less meat, but they are a good starting lesson for her young. The herd is at the water's edge. They are wary as ever, though it is more for the crocodiles in the river than landlocked threats. Common pronghorn are faster than any terrestrial predator and have greater endurance than most, though none of that matters in the river. The fundamentals of hunting pronghorn are not dissimilar from hunting hare and jackal, which Kian and Kahai have become quite good at. They remain upwind and, like the cockatrice, walk on their flat feet as they approach. Even Hyani is able to blend into the foliage now growing near the rivers, and as long as Kian maintains proximity to the shadows cast by the range of trees blooming along the river, she'll be alright too. Hyani charges from the brush. Though she makes no intentional sound, her size and speed quickly alert the pronghorn and they scatter. With greater speed and agility, they quickly put distance between themselves and the massive theropod. Unfortunately for them, the ground is not even, and they can't put their full speed to use. Many are now slowed to having to hop and dodge along the banks. To make matters worse, the young are catching up. Shu watching Uktan hunt often equate juveniles to hounds corralling prey toward parent hunters, but the reality is a much less complex relationship. The young are simply faster and more nimble. Sensitive pads on their feet of Uktan have an incredible sensory apparatus that allows them to feel the general sense of terrain within a few meters of each step. Kahai uses this to great effect, able to maintain a steady sprint over the uneven terrain, as he's able to anticipate where he should place his next step so as not to lose momentum. Unfortunately, the pronghorn are still quick enough that they can make a break for the foliage out to the open prairie and make a run for it. A calf is captured by Hyani, though Druk continues pursuit, and Kahai and Kian are close behind. Once they reach open terrain, the pronghorn pick up speed. For around a kilometer, it seems futile that the three young Ukten keep up pursuit. The pronghorn keep adding the, to the distance, and they don't show signs of slowing down. Unlike some ungulates built to sprint, pronghorn are masters of endurance. Well, 
masters of their clade at the very least. Chases like this are where the many-chambered respiratory system of Uktan come into their own. Different sacs are filled at each step of breathing means there is always fresh oxygen in the bloodstream. Even adults can maintain a steady 25 kilometers per hour jog for a time, while young like Kahai can push 50. Druk can exceed 70 kilometers per hour, nearly the speed of the pronghorn sprint, though he's currently jogging at 50 alongside his younger siblings. Eventually, the pronghorn begin to slow. They have much greater endurance than gazelle or horses, but can, can only maintain a full sprint for a kilometer or so. Pronghorn vastly outnumber gazelle and horses in part because they have greater endurance when fleeing the apex predator of these prairies, but that's not always enough to save them. There are two more bursts of speed as the chase continues, though with each, the theropods gain ground. Eventually the gap has closed to 100 meters, and that's when Druk makes his move. The pronghorn have been running for their lives, but to him, this has just been a warm-up. Druk cuts ahead of the group, closing the distance in a few dozen strides. The herd break formation. Though his brother is locked in, Kahai sees an adolescent buck veer off. It's not to Druk's target, but Kahai zeroes in all the same. The buck has a fourth wind, but it's not enough. Kahai keeps up with each dodge as he closes the distance. Subsisting on little but hares, prairie dogs, and small running fowl of the past two years has made him very proficient at catching nimble game. At four league kilos, the pronghorn is much larger than Kahai's usual prey, but the same principles apply. He catches it with a bite to the hip. As it bucks, slowing down, Kahai then latches onto the back of its neck. His arms reflexively latch on, one over the back to pierce the lungs, and the other around the forelimb to stab the throat. The young buck lets out a strained call to a family who has long since abandoned him, and once Kahai withdraws his left hand claws to pierce higher up the neck, exposure of its wound results in a quick kill. Up ahead, Druk has made a kill of his own. Kian was unsuccessful, but she has made far fewer daytime efforts than Kahai. Though he may not comprehend fairness, which would be just given her nighttime hunts got him through many hungers during the droughts, Kahai may simply just be used to sharing with her. In the birds, which make up a bulk of what he's hunted before, most of the good meat is concentrated in the legs, yet in pronghorns, it's much more distributed throughout the carcass. When eating hair, they usually decapitate and swallow the head first, but the horns of this prey make that challenging. He nips at the cheeks and eye a few times, considering how he might get it down, but after removing and swallowing one of the legs and several organs, he's gotten quite full. Hiani and Druk begin the long walk back to their nest with their catches. Hiani and Druk begin the long walk back to the nest with their catches, but Kian and Kahai remain with their kill, both filled in belly and crop, lounging and relishing the good times at hand.
After a very productive early morning hunt, Kahai offers a chirp to call Kian to him, and the pair jog back toward the nest. Another four years have gone by, all of them with healthy rains and abundant game. Kahai, Kian, and Brakapa are all eight years old and often participate in hunts, while Druk is twelve years old and in a growth spurt, having just surpassed two tons. The triplets departed two years ago, sticking together as a pack, wherein they will remain until they reach maturity. In each of the past four years, Hiani has laid a large clutch of eggs wherein most survived thanks to the protection of their older siblings. While the first few clutches of Ukten always have high mortality, this stage is when their reproductive strategy really comes into its own. Every growth stage has some older Ukten protection, and the only predator large enough to threaten Druk at this age is another older Ukten. There have been no challenges in these four years, and even the dry years have seen enough game to come to the confluence that all mouths are fed. Unfortunately, the good times have their consequences. Druk has reached puberty. His still four years and as many tons from true adulthood, but the rainy season this year came with a spike in hormones. A month ago, he was attentive with the young, active in the hunts, and friendly with the whole family. Now, just as the new batch of chicks hatch, he's aloof, irritable, and at times confrontational. He's leaving scent markings around, often over that of his parents and around the nest, in an effort not only to assert himself, but to cover the scent of his father, which he suddenly finds revolting. This swell of hormones, especially testosterone, has come not only to spark his growth spurt, but also meant to send him off on his own. If he remains, he might challenge his father for the territory, and remaining nearby risks potential inbreeding. Though he has been instrumental in the survival of his younger siblings, if he's ever to have a chance at raising a family of his own, he will need to travel far away. He will want to be as far away from the scent of his parents, though this instinct is at odds with 12 years of associating them and this territory with comfort and safety, and this juxtaposition makes for tender face nuzzles one moment and snarling biting the next. His parents don't truly understand what's going on, in no small part because both of them left their homes before reaching this age. It is a strange, confusing, and stressful time for all involved. Finally, after Druk bit his mother's face following a morning nudge, Trok has had enough. With his mane and feathers all flexed to their full volume and arms spread wide, the seven-ton Uktan bull charges his son. He roars and stomps, dropping dung and snapping his jaws. Druk turns tail and flees the hill. It is an unpleasant and unceremonious send-off to the son who has been critical to the survival not only of their young, but to the parents themselves. But it is what must be done if Druk is to make his way on his own. The spike in hormones occurs with the first rains, so he gets the best chance of hunting plentiful game in the first months on his own. As Druk leaves, Kahai follows, Kyan close behind. Maybe they think Druk is simply going off on a hunt. Perhaps some part of them knows he's leaving, and are departing as well. They're older than when the twins and triplets left, and there have been so many mouths to feed these past four years. Whatever is going through their minds, they have a surprisingly casual demeanor as they follow their older brother, and neither look back. Druk keeps pace at a steady jog. He passes the primary border and markers, persisting long past the northern reaches of their parents' territory, and keeps moving. The winds blow northwest, so he can still pick up what to him is the rancid scent of his parents' markers, so he travels on. Kian and Kahai continue after. They travel along the northern river. Though they keep in sight of Druk, they don't get too close as they can smell his irritation. By afternoon, they are far enough north that they do not smell their parents anymore. There are a thousand new scents, though, and their brains work overtime to process it all. Finally, they reach a lake. 
An enormous mixed herd of giant and common pronghorn, speckled horses, and rune and drake are gathered nearby, some along the water's edge to drink. They move aside as Druk approaches, but he no shows no sign of being on the hunt. He's just been running all day, and has worked up a lot of thirst. Kahai and Kian flank him, drinking on either side. Though he is still hormonal, it seems his sprint has made him more amiable, at least for now. Though they can smell other predators in the area, they do not smell other Uktan, at least no territorial markers. The fact that Harkuti terrorbirds have staked their claim with biting the trunks of local trees is good evidence that there isn't a resident monarch. This will do for now, though Druk wants to keep moving in the morning. As evening approaches, Druk leads a hunt. Together they bring down a Runin Drake. Druk is much less willing to share compared to usual. He's not tender with Kahai and Kian like he once was. He won't nuzzle or preen them. But he tolerates their presence, and for now that's enough. Harakundi could well pose a threat to half-ton Kahai and Kian, especially if they attack in a group. But the Terrorbirds wouldn't dare approach a healthy two-ton adolescent that nearly matches them in speed. For the next week, they sprint and hunt their way further north along the river. Two Uktan territories intersect with their march, and both times, Druk lingers until he's confronted and the trio must flee. Kahai and Kian don't know it, but he's trying to find a mate. At his age and size, he'd be lucky to find a partner at all, but establishing and defending a territory would be completely out of the question for at least another four years, probably more. That reality, however, doesn't stop him from trying. After Druk gets them chased out of their third territory, the trio catch and kill a horse, before settling down by a river for the night. The next morning, they are awakened by the nauseating infrasound of an eldritch song. A mighty conifer pierces the mist shrouding the river, reaching nearly 20 meters into the sky. Though it has no leafy boughs, gnarled and cropped branches jut along the sides. The trunk shifts, inflating slightly with a deep breath. As the tree advances down the river, swaying as though with steps, Kahai begins to comprehend its true form. Each of its four legs are armored, looking hewn of sandstone, with formidable spikes along the tail ends in a studded club. What Kahai mistook for branches are instead horns running along its tail, spreading throughout a massive barrel torso, and up to an enormous neck to a tiny head. This is a Mototan, a titanosaur sauropod. The young Uktan have never seen anything a fraction as large. Uktan are among the largest animals of the prairie, with only the Glanos, a giant Calicathir, being larger. Occasionally, some forest giants, such as the colossal Hukugor sloth or Kotor theskelosaur, wander out onto the prairie and are in the same size range of 6 to 12 tons. All these conventions are shattered by the Mototan. To start, cows often reach 50 tons, while bulls tend to reach 80. This particular bull is among the largest of his kind, attaining a mass of just under 90 tons. All that is deceptive, however, as this species of titanosaur is, like the Uktan, among the most pneumatized of their kind, being so lightly built that they can attain unprecedented sizes. Though his armor is imposing, he's so large that he's been immune to the threat of predation for several decades now, and it is mostly a nutrient storage to supplement the hump of fat at the base of his tail that he will be building up over the next six months of plenty. For now, it's a bit depleted after the dry months, but already after a month of gorging himself, there's a slight rise. 
Eventually, he will have to march to one of the nesting sites and battle other bulls for the right to mate with a herd of cows, but for now, he has only one responsibility. Eating. These rivers are perfect for the task. Unlike his forest cousins who enjoy a steady meal all year round, Mototan leave a life of feast and famine. For the past six months, he has lived on nothing but reserves in the occasional grass, dry ginkgo leaf, and carrion. Now he will consume as much as two tons of horsetail, fern, fruit, and leaves every day. With a neck so long that he can reach either side of the river while walking throughout its center, the Titan has an easy time collecting his daily quota. With any luck, he will reach 120 tons over the next six months and be ready to dominate the rut as he has done every year for over a decade. As the Titan gets closer, even his passive infrasonic calls begin to irritate the sense of ears of the Megaraptorans, and they depart. Throughout the next week, the trio hunt a range of ungulates, ground birds, and thescelosaurs. Though Kian hunts with them, she is much more successful at night, especially as her dark feathers heat up faster as she runs in the heat, and ruffling her feathers only cools them down so much. Druk is more aggressive at kills than he used to be, and his body demands an unprecedented amount of calories. It's not just his size that's changing, but his proportions as well. His head aches as the skull begins to widen from a narrow wedge shape to a width that will enable binocular vision. He's not prey anymore, and the wide field of vision Young need to spot incoming threats is traded for a much more specialized front focus. His next few sets of teeth will also dramatically change. Juveniles have uniform, flat, knife-shaped teeth, while adults have three tooth types. Small pegs at the front for scraping bone, a pair of sturdy fangs toward the front of each maxilla, and rear teeth that are short and stocky to help break bone. Juvenile teeth have some serrations to help cut flesh, yet adults are smooth, specialized in gripping and restraint so the hands can more easily enact a killing blow. The constant headache he is feeling as his skull and teeth begin to change which will peak over the next two years, following for more of overall size change, has compounded to bake a miserable mood he's in due to the hormonal spike. This all adds up to him being generally unwilling to share his kills, at least not until he's had his fill, and even stealing kills from the younger two if he's unsuccessful. In the rare instance that he's satisfied and not in pain, he does try to make amends, but each time he snaps at them, Kahai and Kian get a little more wary of his presence. This only worsens once the year progresses to the dry season. Druk has gained nearly a ton along with major morphological changes, yet hogging most of the food has left the younger siblings short of their hundred or so kilos they should have gained this season. Once the dry months begin, and there's any food that they catch goes to Druk, the younger siblings are forced to hunt on their own, and only return after having eaten their meals. One night, at the height of the dry season, Druk and the others pick up a familiar scent. Kelator. This is an adolescent male. Like Druk, he's been chased from the herd by his father. At one and a half tons, he's almost half as heavy as Druk. Druk hunted Kelatar with his parents, but he's never done it alone. This adolescent is larger than Druk has ever taken on his own, but hunger and desperation drive him in. The Kelatar smells Druk approach and immediately hungers down. Kahai and Kian have also observed, but never participated in hunting adult Kelatar. Kahai has performed both tail hold and kill with juveniles, but even his immense hunger has not been enough to drive him to attack a Kelatar twice his size. Druk circles the giant armadillo. He grabs the tail and is strong enough to restrain it, yet this does little but bother the herbivore. 
He's quick enough when he releases the tail that it swings harmlessly toward him. The tail then flicks down, smashing at the parched soil. Druk circles about. He gives the herbivore a few shoves, but he's not well positioned to flip the beast. His next shove and kick are more out of irritation than an effort to make the target vulnerable. He even tries to push his claws into the gap between shell and head, but a sudden shift of the Kelator as its hairs feel his claws approach means that it deflects the attempt. Druk then stomps on its head with no evident impact. Druk braces his chest against the Kelotar, then uses his strong legs and hoof-like hind claws to start to dig. His hand claws don't pierce deep into the shell, but it's enough to hold. As he shoves, the shell finally lifts, though the flailing kick of the Kelotar catches him in the shin with a sickening crack. As Druk lets go, taking a limping step back, the tail that swings in an effort to right the Kelotar strikes Druk's leg just above where it kicks. Seemingly blinded by rage, pain, and hunger, Druk lunges while the Kelotar struggles. He bites at its throat, ignoring the strikes of its blunt claws. His own talons stab wildly, striking in and out of its belly and chest. It is a slow, messy, bloody affair, but eventually the Kelotar stops moving. Druk limps back. Amidst a dozen minor injuries, his right leg is fractured and badly bruised, and the Kelotar's claws tore a deep gash in his lip to reveal several teeth. Indifferent to his wounds, a famished Druk dives in. Even after he's had his fill, Druk does not let Kian and Kahai approach. Later that evening, they have visitors. <clears throat> Later that evening, they have visitors. <laughs> Though Jackal, Hyena, and Cockatrice have been drawn to the scent of Druk's kill, none of these 30 to 100 kilo predators are a threat to Kahai and Kiam, much less a three ton Druk. However, the Harkundi now marching along the river are as a much different story. Each weigh around 300 kilos, though much more importantly, their imposing height of 3 meters, paired with a formidable beak, makes them one of the few threats to Kahai and Kian. If that weren't enough, during the dry season they are forced to hunt much larger game. Harkundi can form surprisingly large coalitions. This one has seven birds, and they have begun to fan out. Druk won't let Kahai and Kian get too close, but the number of scavengers gather. One hyena or cockatrice might not be a problem, but as many as 60 are now assembled, all keeping to the tall grass and waiting for their moment. The Harkundi have no such inclination to hide. The Harkundi have no such inclination to hide. At full height and with wings spread, they move as one toward the carcass. Kahai and Kian back toward Druk in one last effort to unite, but he snaps and hisses at them with the same venom he does with the hyenas and cockatrice. He's in such pain, and there are so many threatening scents and sounds that he can't tell what is family. Kahai turns and flees out toward the open prairie, away from the approaching terror birds. Hyan is right behind him. A few hyenas and cockatrice give chase, though both are substantially slower than an eight-year Uktan. Once they are a kilometer off, Kahai looks back. The terror birds have closed in. Druk has stood on shaking legs, his own arms spread as he lunges at any who get too close. Though he is an imposing sight, the birds know he is weak. If Druk refuses to surrender his kill, this may be his last night. The terror birds keep checking for vulnerability, and his slowing reactions reflect weakness and injury taking their toll. Kyung chirps at Kahai, 
and the two continue out to the open prairie. They will never know if the brother who raised them survived the night. Nearly six years have passed, and with a raging storm, the wet season is in full force. Kahai is seated in the shade of a full olive tree, hoping to keep out of the rain. At just over four tons, he is a healthy weight for his age of fourteen. A full dark mane, tall golden crown, and padding of healthy fat over the muscles of his lower jaw and sides of his tail and dark eye patches are all signals of good health and maturity, though he's still a few years and tons from claiming a territory of his own. As in his youth, his feathers are a deeper gold than typical of his kind. Now that he's dried out a bit, Kahai takes to preening, periodically pushing oils from a gland at the base of his tail with his snout and rubbing it throughout his feathers to keep them waterproof. Another Uktan approaches from deeper within the stand of olive trees. With her own coat a rich, dark umber, Kian also have come into her own. She also has a thick tail base of a mature adult, covering a mass of muscles connecting thigh to tail which power their formidable stride of the Uktan. Like Kahai, the reserves are so broad that they nearly match the breadth of her hips and torso, proof that the pair have been eating very well. She and her brother share a brief nuzzle before she takes a seat beside him. These years have been plentiful enough that, even though they get apprehensive of each other from time to time, a natural response to being near relatives during hormone rushes, they've managed to remain a team. He has more success during the day while she has better luck at dusk, and that has carried them through these years without adult protection or a steady territory. They've certainly had their challenges, and each has a suite of trophy scars to show for it, but having to roam around and experiment with a wide range of prey, in no small part driven by Kahai's curiosity, has served them very well. They are now not only familiar with, but proficient at hunting dozens of prey items across the prairie. One species they have not yet mastered is a herd now marching through the grassy fields half a kilometer to the north, barely visible through the rain. The giant buffalo. This species is a close relative of the Cape Buffalo of Earth, evolving from the mighty Sincerus Antiquus. They are taller than their ancestors by a substantial margin, yet not as robust. Even the largest bull, which can in extreme cases weigh two and a half tons and are armed with horns that span over three meters, they reliably can be killed by a lone uktan of their size. A pair of uktan can kill a lone bull without a problem, which Kahai and Kian observed their parents do several times, though in each instance this was a lone older bull. Unfortunately, Horns and size are not the buffalo's primary defense. Their main defense is the herd. When Kian and Kahai hunt pronghorn, runendrake, or horses, the herd is a distraction. 
numbers scattering and intertwining to make it hard for a predator to maintain focus on their target. A social group of buffalo will gather young to their center and flee as one. Bulls will be on the edge, using their horns as a deterrent while they and the group flee. This is a daunting formation. However, it only gets worse when the Uktan catch a member of the herd. If the kill is not perfectly executed and quickly, if the claws fail to silence the distress call or whichever buffalo they catch, challenging to perform with the horns in the way and a thick, flexible dewlap, then the true strength of the buffalo comes into play. As they have seen their parents readily tackle lone bulls and even bachelor groups, but never a herd with young. Kahai and Kian don't even register the herd marching past as prey. All that changes when the herd let out a warning call and begin to charge. They're running west, away from Kahai and Kian, so are not a threat, yet the movement piques their interest all the same. Kahai stands, using his snout to push up to his feet, and ruffles his feathered coat before stepping out into the rain. Though buffalo are surprisingly fast, and he's not as swift as he was a year and a ton ago, but Kahai knows he's sufficiently faster and more agile that he doesn't have much to fear. He can approach with a degree of confidence in his safety. He hears Kian grumbling behind him, though she does follow him into the storm. The herd, several hundred strong, have assumed a flight formation. As they close the distance, Kahai sees several enormous bulls on the perimeter swinging long, curved horns to deter approach. Out on the fringes, further north and behind the group, Kahai identifies several silhouettes above the height of the stampede. Other Uktan. One of them rushes close, sparing Kahai a quick glance before continuing her pursuit. She is a sub-adult Uktan. By height and frame, not to mention the scent he detects as she jogs past, Kahai determines she is a year older than him and Kian. Her feathers are a light sandy brown, though her spots fade to the point of being barely noticeable. While Kahai and Kian's eyes have matured to a bright crimson, this stranger's eyes are a very deep red, to the degree that they look almost black at a glance. The dark-eyed stranger carries on, maintaining speed as she veers toward the herd. Kahai keeps a few paces behind, watching her as much as the buffalo. Another stranger, this one almost white in plumage and scale, cuts in front of Kahai and the newcomer. He's the same age as the new female, though his dimorphism shows in being over a ton larger than Kahai. He rushes at one of the buffalo males, anticipating the swing and hook of its horns, and catches where head meets neck in his jaws. Just as the bull calls out, the female Kahai follows, rushes in, not to aid the white Uktan, but toward the herd. She roars and screeches, mimicking the pitch and tone of a distress call of a buffalo. This seems to disorient the herd, and they seem torn between charging her, fleeing, and finding which direction her and the real call are coming from. Kahai gets a bit closer to the herd, enjoying their confused grunts and indecisive waverings. The stranger suddenly turns and picks up her pace. The buffalo have been running in confusion of before, but it appears they have decided where to direct their ire. The charge is suddenly much quicker than Kahai anticipated. They are suddenly closing the distance, and several large bulls leading the stampede are now only ten or so meters behind him. Curiosity quickly melts to fear, and Kahai sprints back toward the olive trees. Another call comes from further north, matching the distress call he heard from the initial buffalo, as the herd turns toward it, leaving Kahai to his stranger. Even so, Kahai keeps running past the stranger as she slows to a halt. Once he's put more distance between them and the herd, Kahai stops and looks north as he sees a pair of young Uktan in that direction. They look a bit younger, perhaps a year his junior, and are so swift they all but steer the herd. He looks back and sees the white bull has successfully restrained and executed his target. Kahai jogs back toward the stranger. 
We call her Oniya, feminine for the sun. As soon as Oniya looks back to Kahai, he begs to bob his head and emit an infrasonic hum. When she doesn't immediately balk, he continues. As his hum crescendos to a song we could hear, he stands almost fully erect and spreads his arms. After a long stretch and rhythmic flex of his clawed hands, he lowers so she can see the full width of his fat reserves at the base of his tail. As he switches between these two poses, he's alternating between which foot he stands on and which hoof-like claws rake holes in the mud. They are instinctive steps, not something he was taught. After repeating the cycle a few more times, he transitions to a slow walk to her left, then to her right. Each step is slow and exaggerated to maximize her ability to see that every muscle and joint leads to a methodical and seemingly effortless movement. He flexes and compresses the feathers of mane and tail tip, something he could only do in the rain if the hydrophobic oils of his tail glands were at full production due to good health. In times of nutrient strain, oils and fat reserves are the first things to go. To emphasize this last point, he yawns while looking up, turning so that she can see every tooth and muscle are in excellent condition. If she's impressed, she doesn't show it. Although she watches the whole display, she doesn't join him in the back and forth walk to put on a show of her own. Normally, both sexes display to one another, as it's important for both to assess their respective potential. She takes a few paces in mirror as he walks left, but rather than turn with him to the right, she watches him for the next steps, then turns back out to the white male. Uktan are a generally monogamous species. In these years between puberty at around 10 to 13 years old, depending on the production of the seasons, and full adulthood at around the age of 20, by which time they will be large enough to establish and defend a territory, Uktan are in their dating years. Some of these teen couples might mate and even nest, though without the safe and stability of a territory, there's almost no chance of these unions even making it to hatching, and usually these pairs don't even bother trying until they have a territory of their own. Once a territory is established, they remain together, but before settling down, many might spend a season together, then drift apart. It is a time to test the waters and find a trustworthy partner. Kahai and Kian were joined by a pair of females of their age the year before, and while one of the sisters and Kahai started to bond, they left at the start of the dry season. Kahai follows her, though at a distance, especially when she gets closer to the white male. Once he picks up Kahai's scent and the hormone rush accompanying his dance, the male stands. Blood from the buffalo carcass is striking against his pale snout. With a deep growl, he looms and advances toward Kahai. This male is the same age as Oniya, and although not as large as a fully mature adult, he's still over a ton heavier than Kahai. He flexes out a pale mane, shaking it out as he spreads his arms. It's a different display than Kahai's mating dance, though the intent to show health and fitness is the same. Now that he's closer, Kahai can smell that this is not Oniya's mate, but her brother, Adoyi. Just as Kahai and Kian have been together so do not need to settle for the first partner they meet, so too have Oniya and Odoyi been able to take their time. Single siblings tend to choose mates quite young. If an Uktan has a few siblings, they can afford to be more selective as they have already got a hunting partner and can choose their mate less on availability and more on compatibility. Sometimes this can lead to standards being too high to give potential mates a chance, but at the end of the day, Uktan are choosing a partner whom which they will rely on for the next 20 to 30 years. They must count on them in rain or parched skies, hunting dangerous monsters together, chasing off constant threats to their young, and defending a territory with tooth and claw. Their lives will depend upon each other entirely. It takes a lot more than a single dance to cement such a bond. 
While Aruyu does not see Kahai as a threat regarding his sister, it's an unfamiliar male reeking of new hormones and is not welcome. The much larger male charges. It's a gesture of display, not with any real violent intent, but Kahai understands and backs off. A bit dejected and now having worked up quite an appetite to chase the following dance, Kahai ambles back to the olive grove. Kyan is not there. Kahai sniffs the air, letting out a confused howl. Kian responds, and Kahai looks to see her further east at a different buffalo carcass, this one with a pair of ukten nearly as large as her. Kahai jogs the distance to his sister. As he scans, even through the rain he sees at least half a dozen carcasses, perhaps more further out in the storm, each with a small crowd of young Uktan gathered round. Despite appearances and their cooperation while charging and scattering the herd, this is not a united pack of thirty or so subadult Uktan. When game is plentiful, loose coalitions of many subadult groups will gather together, sometimes cooperating with complete strangers. These are the proving grounds upon which many Uktan relationships begin. Through rites of combat, couples can prove or break their compatibility in ways that dance can only imply. This test sometimes fails, as evident by many Uktan waiting their turn by one of the successful kills, and these failures can sometimes be absolute. Kahai walks around the corpse of a female his age, gored through the chest and trampled by a thousand hooves. Her partner, who might one day have been her mate, is seated quietly beside her. Their bond was new, only beginning with the first storm of the year, yet he sits in vigil all the same, glaring and hissing at any who dare approach. As Kahai walks by, he sees two Uktan are performing a synchronized mating dance for Kian. These twins are Matro and Makar. Though a year her junior, they have brought down this buffalo on their own, and are intent on using that to impress her. Though they may not remain together indefinitely, sometimes siblings of the same sex will share a mate. This can greatly decrease infant mortality in the first few clutches, as a pair can still hunt, while one adult remains to guard the nest. Eventually one sibling tends to be favored to the point that the other leaves, but especially this young, there are a lot of advantages to siblings sharing a partner. The two young brothers have proven they can hunt as a team. It's a strong impression for a first date. Kian does seem impressed. She has started to walk with them, continuing as they periodically pause, to show that she is in excellent fitness. Though small for her age, and already females tend to grow at a slightly slower rate after 14, she's still in very good condition, with full fat reserves and excellent stability as she alters which feet and folds her arms in to prove that she can balance without their aid. For a time, Kahai watches their display in the pouring rain. As the trio finish their dance, the brothers step aside and let Kian dig in. Kahai wanders through the field of carcasses, with many serving as a dinner table for a first date. The next couple he passes are both male. They are not brothers, but unrelated males engaged in a mating ritual. Same-sex pairings are extremely rare in adults, usually incorporating a third member of the opposite sex once a territory is established so that they may actually reproduce, though as many as 10% of these subadult pairings are between two males and two females. Eventually, Kahai finds a carcass of a month-old calf that got trampled in the stampede. No Uktan has claimed it, as they are much more attentive to impressing mates. Not much impressive about claiming a calf you didn't even kill. Though a few hyenas and cockatrices have braved the crowds of Uktan to break it open, they flee as Kahai approaches. The loins and stomach were already claimed by the smaller scavengers, but it's still a serviceable meal, and small enough that Kahai can swallow it whole. Satisfied, at least in calories, 
Kahai returns to his stand of olive trees and waits out the storm. Throughout the following weeks, Kahai and Kian accompany the coalition of subadult Uktan following the herd. As they travel, the herd meets up with other buffalo herds, forming an increasingly challenging formation. Other Uktan coalitions join them, and there are now hundreds of Uktan following tens of thousands of buffalo. The buffalo season of mating has begun, and bulls must fight each other as well as fending off theropods. Fortunately for the Uktan, they often don't even need to hunt to get a meal, or at least to have an easy kill. This isn't going to impress any potential mates, though, so it's not uncommon for only young Uktan to go for these kills. Though Kian often spends her nights with Kahai, most of her day is spent with the twins Matsuro and Makar. They hunt as a unit, often dancing before and after. It's exhausting, but it's necessary to prove to a potential partner that you can do more than just coast through the good times. If they are to be depended upon during the dry months, above and beyond the minimum is the expectation. Although Kahai has not killed a buffalo of his own, instead scavenging or hunting rudin drake or horses following the herd, he often participates in the hunt as a runner. While it may be driven more by curiosity or thrill, this is still teaching him important lessons on how the buffalo react to different situations. He quickly learns they are smarter than he first assumed. While they may fall for a distress call or follow him instead of Kian's suitors or Onia and Odoi as they make a kill, they seem to often know if he's making a mock charge. He got used to them not reacting much, so when he actually tried to go in for a kill, the bull rounded on him quick, and it was a tense few seconds as Kahai scrambled a redirection and sprinted away. Fortunately, even at his four-ton mass, Uktan are so lightly built that much of their weight is concentrated at the hips that he can evade with surprising proficiency. His hope to Oniya and Adoyi making their kills has not gone unnoticed. Although Adoyi initially chased Kahai off, he's actually more welcoming of the younger bull at their kill than Oniya. Kahai occasionally initiates a dance with Oniya, although she does not seem interested in joining him. It is clear that she is very particular, though considering Kahai is the only unrelated male in the coalition she hasn't chased off, he seems inspired to still make an effort. In a grace period between storms, Adoyi leaves his sister to seek out a potential mate of his own throughout the coalition. He's the largest Uktan present and attracts a lot of attention. Several females initiate a dance with him, even leaving their partners of their own to openly step away from, but Adoyi does not engage. He might stop and politely watch, but he doesn't dance. He doesn't have a potential mate in mind. Like his sister, everything about Adoyi's presence and presentation reinforces that he can have his pick. Finally, a female catches his eye. This is Tekka. She's been making her kills alone. Like Adoyi and Oniya, she's 15 and approaching somatic or skeletal maturity, though her skeleton still has a bit more growing and she'll become a lot more robust by full maturity at around the age of 18. Tekka is massive for her size and sex, being almost as big as Adoyi and a bit taller. She will push the upper limits of size in female Uktan once she fully matures. This has been intimidating for many males, though Odoi shows no such apprehension. Though Teka ignored many other males that even dared approach, she watches Odoi as he takes his first steps and joins once his initial presentation is complete. Their dance is observed by all. Once complete, Teka invites Adoyi to share the buffalo she killed that morning. Later that week, Kahai awakens to an unfamiliar song. Oniya calls to him. 
Adoyi and Teka are hunting together, and though Oniya joined them for a few hunts, it seems playing third wheel for her brother's budding romance was not worth the security and familiarity of staying by his side. Kahai and Kyan watch as she dances. The movements are proficient, driven by instinct, but she seems stiff, awkward. This is new, and she doesn't seem to like it. Even so, Oniya puts in the effort, bobbing her head up and down as she alternates feet, letting out a range of calls while taking a bow to conclude her invitation. Kahai eagerly joins her dance. Once they are finished, Kian goes to join her suitors, while Kahai follows Oniya for the hunt. While Kahai has yet to make a kill, he's gotten quite proficient at evading buffalo, luring by mimicry, and anticipating their movements. He's helped Oniya and Adoyi make several kills. Oniya has been impressed so far. However, though she can't say as much, Oniya needs to know that she can do more than just herd, mock, and dodge. If she is going to trust him as a potential mate, she needs to see him kill. As they approach, she flanks him. While hunting with Kian, Druk, and their parents, Kahai learned that this means that she wants him to lead the hunt. Though he may be nervous, the pressure to perform well in front of Oniya is such that he braves the effort. Others have joined in the hunt, and the herd is on the move. As one might expect, any obvious target were already brought down in the first few weeks of hunting. The herd, losing a dozen or so members a day, and with any ailments, were the first to go. Now that the bulls are constantly fighting to assert their position in these factions of herds, newly injured bulls are found every day. Kahai is not too proud to target one of these individuals, but he doesn't see one in the section or the rear of the herd he's now approaching. The Uktan have largely fanned out into a wide U as they drive the buffalo west. As none have been claimed, the herd forms up and holds rank, although their charge will be at the first sound of distress. An older bull lags behind. He's enormous, taller at the shoulder than Kahai's chest, and his horns span four meters. Although he's certainly more intimidating than the cows a few paces ahead, Kahai has observed far more support and defense by other bulls toward cows and all rush in defense of a calf. While they sometimes support other bulls, they get far less support, which makes him a far easier target in the context of their herd dynamics. Also, while his massive horns help him dominate conflicts with other male buffalo and are quite attractive to the cows and intimidating predators to behold, they're actually not as efficient as fighting Uktan as the shorter horns of many other bulls. Having over 100 kilos of horn on his head is quite a load to bear, especially given exhaustion of most waking minutes the past few weeks spent fighting and mating. His horns are so heavy that when he glances back to see Kahai behind him, his head turns at a labored pace. Though Kahai moves at a jog, when he sees the bull straining to look back, he rushes in. The bull spotted him to the left, so Kahai races to the right. Even though the horns turn slow, it's faster than Kahai anticipated. He's been hoping to bite at the base of the head, just where neck meets the horn boss, but he has to take a defensive maneuver of biting the horn instead. The bull bucks, but thankfully he's too tired to call out in distress. His full efforts are spent to throw Kahai off. Kahai's bite is strong enough that his teeth dig into horn, but he's having to invest more effort into holding on than to position for a kill. And while the raking of his claws and neck are certainly painful, there's so much muscle in the buffalo's neck that supporting his horns that the claws aren't piercing his throat without a much closer position. He swings his head to the right and catches Kahai's leg in that hard impact at his ankle. Though Kahai keeps his footing, the horns slip from his jaws and the head rotates for a better angle to properly gore. Though he prepares a jab at Kahai's thigh, his head suddenly jerks to the left. 
Onia needs to see that Kahai could hunt, but she doesn't need to see him do it alone. She has the left horn firm in her jaws. As a three-year veteran of buffalo hunts, she knows to come from below and to get the horns as far back in her jaws as possible, letting the strong of her bite restrain. Kahai doesn't waste a moment clamping his jaws firm against the other horn. Together, both Uktan push the bull's head down. As he's now in a much more advantageous position, Kahai rises up, leans his full weight against the buffalo's back, and pierces the meat of its neck with his left-hand claws. With his right, he feels where the saggy dewlap meets the throat and pushes both talons in. It's not a clean kill, as Kahai has never brought down something near as large as this three-ton bull, and the loose dewlap makes accuracy difficult. But after a few stabs, his claws finally penetrate the throat, wheezing as his strength leaks out onto the prairie, gasping for a breath that will never come. The buffalo finally collapses. Kahai withdraws his talons. The herd and other Uktan carry on, having now left him and Oniya behind. Kahai spreads his arms and initiates another dance. This time, Oniya immediately joins him. He has a slight limp from where the horn struck, but thankfully it's little more than a bruise, and he's able to walk it off without betraying any sign of pain. Besides, the rush and excitement of the hunt and their bond is far more present in his mind. This song and dance has them circle around their kill, finally meeting at the front, where they share a tender nuzzle of their armored snouts. The hunt and dance have him quite ready for a meal, and they tuck in with abandon. Four months go by. Adoyi and Teka are mated and have long since left the coalition. Kian and her twin mates Matro and Makar linger near Kahai and Onia, and the five of them hunt together through the rest of the wet season. As the dry season sets in, the five Uktan in the same reason struggle to find enough game, and the twins become increasingly distant. Kian is torn. They still initiate mating dances to reaffirm their bond, but often hunt on their own. Eventually, the twins depart, following the southern migration of prairie elk. Though Kian is hesitant at first, she decides to accompany the twins. Kahai and Onia are alone. She was already anxious after her brother left, and is stressed by anything new but a full belly seems to assuage the worry. Now she's in constant apprehension. A week passes with no abundant game, and they are forced to scavenge. They are simply too large to subsist on small game anymore. Her family learned how to visit baked lake beds. Though the water has run dry, there are gifts hidden below the cracked mud if you know where to look. She shows Kahai how to detect dig out, and extract buried lungfish. It's not much, but in their starvation, it's a welcome respite. On the hot summer morning, Kahai detects a familiar scent. Hunger drives him up, and he nudges for Onuya to accompany. Though she hisses at him upon her awakening, she smells it too, and follows. This is not a scent that she associates with food, but she can see his confidence and chooses to trust her suitor. After walking for several kilometers, Kahai brings them to a familiar sight, and one that promises hope for the season. Kelatar. It is a whole herd, with several females, their young, and a bull. He makes sure that they stay downwind. Kahai is not large enough to be confident in flipping the bull, but he notices a female without a calf. Oniya watches. She calls out several times. Her parents avoid Kelatar. 
One of her younger siblings approached one in curiosity and was crippled and killed by its claws. She has grown to care for Kahai, noting his creativity and flexibility, but also considers him a bit naive and impulsive. She doesn't know that he is from a family that have mastered this tricky game. It is certainly easier with accompaniment, but Kahai can do this on his own, and he knows there's not a lot of time to set up and educate. If he is to convince Onia to remain with him through the dry months ahead, he needs to validate that trust that she has placed in him. Kahai charges. Most of the Kelatar clump together, though a few simply drop down and start flailing their tails. As soon as he's beside the lone female, Kahai hunkers down beside her and gives a shove. She topples over. As he is head to toe with her, Kahai is able to quickly step back and stab her neck before she is able to right herself. The bull rushes over and Kahai retreats, but he is confident his strike was true. Although the bull lingers for a little while, the herd gives some space after hence a half hour passes. The Kelatar has bled out, and Kahai summons Onia over. She sniffs the prey. She has never eaten Kelatar, not even scavenged, so it is a strange and new proposition. She may not like unfamiliar things, but she's quite hungry, and Kahai initiates another dance. Though she is tired and eager to eat, Onia reciprocates a brief routine and nuzzle before Kahai opens the carcass and they indulge. Throughout the next months, Kelatar make up a vast majority of their diet. Onia becomes quite proficient in both hunting on her own and aiding in either role, and having access to this unconventional game carries both Uktan and their relationship through to the first storms of the season. Even though their bond is quite strong, they rejoin the coalition when the buffalo return. Adoyi and Teka are not present, as they have gone on to find a territory to claim. Kian and the twins are still together, and the five of them spend the next months together hunting and growing, with each ending the season a full ton heavier. When they part ways at the next dry season, with Kian and her mates fully bonded, they will not cross paths again. In the following months, Onia and Kahai's partnership only grows stronger. It is a more forgiving dry season, and there is plenty of game to still choose from. With more options, they are able to eat more, bulking up to perhaps claim a territory within a few years. Throughout the next wet season, Onia has reached six tons, and Kahai six and a half. The following season is one of the most arid in a decade, Yet the pair makes it through, mostly on a diet of Kelatar and buried lungfish. Over the next two years, Kahai reaches seven tons. As the sun sets on a rainy evening, Kahai and Oniya relax and digest a full meal, seeking shelter under a large olive tree. They press their full weight against each other, occasionally nuzzling the sensitive scales on their snout against each other. They drift to sleep. In the morning, they will begin searching for a place with sufficient game year-round in a dry hill on which to lay a nest, a territory, a home to call their own.
With the start of a new melody, a spark ignites in the hazy, instinctive consciousness of a little theropod dinosaur's mind. He knows it is time to hatch. Kahai leans in, continuing his song to beckon the hatchling to break free. He is now 20 years old, and at over 7 tons, at least as large as his father. He and Onia have held this territory in the Northern River for a full year now. This is their first clutch of eggs in the new territory, and they have managed to bring all three to Hatching Day. The first storm of the season ended last night, and it is time for the young to awaken and explore this dangerous and wonderful world. The first egg hatches. The eye looking out at Kahai is the usual blue of an Uktan child, yet dark like that of its mother. Its feathers are a dark gold, just as Kahai's. It wriggles free of the shell, gasping for air as it takes an overwhelming first impression of the prairie. The other two hatch shortly after. Like his sister Kian, one is melanistic. The chicks all try to stand, but it's too early. They explore every centimeter of the nest with snout and foot. After taking it all in, they collapse in exhaustion. Kahai removes the shells, setting them on the far side of the hill so as not to draw in nest raiders. Shortly thereafter, Onia returns with the spoils of her hunt, a runin drake. After feeding the children their first meal, Onia sits beside Kahai. The sun sets in the west, and under a fiery sky, the great monarchs of the Housie Prairie take their rest. Mm -hmm.